Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Under the leadership of its president, Judith Rodin, the Rockefeller Foundation has anchored its dual imperatives to advance inclusive economies while building resilient communities capable of responding to, in their words, acute shocks and chronic stresses of contemporary society. Our guest today molds this future one project at a time. The managing director of the Rockefeller Foundation, Claudia Drusch, uniquely bridges ideas across geography and discipline through residency projects. Considering questions of global consequence, Yush is at the forefront of these diverse endeavors, from books and musical compositions to policy formulations and curricula design. Among the explorations this year, how to foster a public voice in a new gilded age, how to reimagine public housing for contemporary cities, and how to prevent major epidemics. So first let me ask our guest today about that collective good that unifies Bellagio and Rockefeller as a whole. Claudia, how do you successfully chart these projects to define well-being in a way we can all agree on well-being? That's well-being. Thank you very much, Alexander, for having me on your program. Um, well, well-being is a multi-dimensional con multi -dimensional concept. So uh, that is what really Bellagio, the Bellagio Center in Italy on the Lake Como facilitates uh, as one of the programs of the Rockefeller Foundation and brings together residents, about 15 residents uh, at a time that come from different disciplines, sectors um, and uh, geographies and each one then contributes their strengths. So uh, Henry E. Brady and Kay Schlossman work on inequality in the U.S. Uh, and what is the political voice um, that needs to be heard that we have a more equal society. At the same time, there is someone there that works on uh, pandemics. And the conversations that happen over the meal times and while people are there is really what then kind of informs our understanding of well-being. Hmm. I ask you because it seems increasingly, and you have such an international perspective that I wonder if you can reflect on this, looking at the U.S. and you're headquartered here in New York, and traveling across the globe searching for opportunities to enhance the quality of life for, for people from continent to continent. Do you think here in the United States we have more difficulty in defining well-being in a way that we can form consensus? No, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think that well-being is defined in nuances differently across the globe, um, depending on cultures and mentalities and what the needs of people are and where there are gaps where the needs are not being met. Um, so when you look at certain countries, water scarcity might be a much more prominent need, uh, and in other areas it might be uh, the freedom of speech. Um, and so in assessing well-being and looking at well-being um, and, and demanding um, that uh, well-being is, uh, uh, is created, um, people really require different things or emphasize different things across the globe. And in the emphasis of um, defining what that well-being is, what do you find to be 
most unifying the countries that are represented. And there are over 80 countries that have been historically represented, I believe. Um, and from South Africa, India, China, Nigeria, Kenya, Italy, Nicaragua, France, and the U.S. Uh, most recently at 88 fellows. Um, what do you find to be a source of, of greatest uh, unity among the countries? And the number of countries is even larger than what we find in, mm -hmm. uh, in 2015. Um, so there, are, there have been many more countries uh, to the center. I think one topic that definitely comes up again and again because it's so connected to issues of poverty, um, issues of, uh, of well-being generally, the question of security, um, of peace, um, in whether it, it regards uh, fragile countries or conflict-ridden regions, um, the question of how can different ethnic minorities or different groups live together, uh, people of different religion. Uh, I think that is a topic um, that uh, probably unifies uh, most of the countries that come to the center. And would you say that inclusiveness has a, a unified uh, definition in terms of how people relate to each other? Or do you find that developing and developed countries uh, don't necessarily agree to how inclusive they want to be today? I don't know if there's a significant difference in terms of uh, what the ambition is. I think the, the, the ambition at the, at the level of the people, I think, seems, seems very similar to me in terms of uh, what people are looking for. They are looking for equitable societies where people have um, equitable access to, let's say, health services, to economic opportunities, uh, where they can participate in an economy, uh, where they know what the rules of the game are, uh, where uh, they know if they establish a business, these are the rules that we need to um, comply with. So I feel that across the globe what people expect in terms of what e inclusive economies mean is, is fairly similar. I think w where countries differ across the globe is really where the gaps are. Um, and, and so we will see, we see different gaps in the U.S. than we see in, in Kenya or we see in Vietnam. Is the climate change issue um, from the foundation's perspective, and when you do sit around the table, you, you identified security. I, I would wonder if that's physical or mental or both, but physical and, and physical security from the climate threat issue is uh, one in which countries are collectively acknowledging as the principal um, obstacle to well-being. Is, was that uh, uh, palpable to you? Yes, I mean, it's certainly, especially when you now think of um, the, the COP meetings taking place in Paris, we have, we do two things at the center. We host residencies, so individuals uh, for four weeks, as well as conferences for a week. And so we had a lot of conference requests um, that, we, that we accepted in preparation, for example, of the COP meetings. Um, we, uh, we are going to have a meeting uh, there next year uh, where negotiators from um, developing countries come to Bellagio. So how can developing countries and smaller developing countries make their voice heard in, in the climate change negotiations? I mean, those are just a few of the examples of things that take place at the center. And that is certainly critical when we connect it back to well-being, because one of the, the reasons why the foundation is engaged in activities around climate change or environmental degradation is that those things really have the ability to wipe out everything that we do towards poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. So we can fund kind of helping people get access to economic opportunity, but if then... Um, water scarcity or more rain affects how they grow their crops. Uh, it, it basically has the ability to make null and void what we have previously funded. So those are certainly critical areas when you look at both things together. And they're reflected in the conversations? Yes, yes. You see these, these um, 
proposals in their rawest form. And I'm wondering the output, what's, imp what's the important output from the foundation's perspective that really the, the, the rawness that you um, are kind of marinating in at the foundation level at the center then is transformed into something that really helps people? And what are, what, are there any particular examples that you like to identify where a project yielded that kind of global output where policy has shifted now? In, in terms of outputs, I mean, th th that is certainly what we would ideally look for. So shifting policy globally, that doesn't always happen. Um, many times it's, it's influencing a field. So, for example, the, uh, the, 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 the person that you were referring to who was working on climate change, particularly with a look at uh, black communities in the U.S., that's really, the, the Bellagio residency is really informing her work uh, and what she's doing around that and developing a strategy, uh, how to work with utility companies, for example, uh, in using renewable energy to power schools, to power hospitals. Um, and, and so in, in that regard, make the connection between climate change uh, within communities. Um, so we are really hoping for people at the minimum level that they influence the, the field that they come from, uh, whether it's health or whether it's housing or some of the other examples that we have given. We have also um, clearly hosted people such as Mohamed Yunus, um, before he won the Peace Nobel Prize. Uh, so then people have really gone on um, and uh, implemented those remarkable uh, global things. And often they had that kernel uh, of initial thinking at the Bellagio Center. From your experience at Bellagio and the foundation, uh, is there a unified purpose in what is increasingly a big bank, big financial culture? Um, you know, you, you, I, I wonder, what is the relationship these days between a Rockefeller Foundation and um, the big banking institutions, not just in the U.S., but globally? There, there is some connection, probably mainly around impact investing, uh, and that moves beyond the Bellagio Center. Um, you may know that uh, impact investing was a large initiative uh, of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and we are still in that space. We now uh, work on what we call innovative finance, and there we work with big banks. Um, around motivating impact investors um, to provide capital uh, for um, NGOs and, and social entrepreneurs to address the problems that we, that we all care about. Um, and so, and we do that in the belief that when you look at official development aid, when you look at the total of foundation money um, that can be brought to bear towards these problems, it's by far not enough. So it requires private capital um, and not only the banking sector, but the, the private sector in total um, to work along with us. Uh, on the social problems um, and um, some of these activities like defining what could impact investing be, what is the stock exchange for impact investors, those are some of the things that were created in meetings at the Bellagio Center but then also are driven forward through programs uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation. Impact investing, um, where do you see the greatest promise for impact investing to resolve any of the inequalities that Rockefeller identifies as the gravest threat to civilization? Challenging question, um, probably relevant for, for many areas um, in the sense of there is pent up demand is, is our kind of assessment uh, in terms of fam family offices, um, high net worth individuals, uh, but also institutional investors to find investments that have also social impact. Um, and um, 
th that social impact can be realized, whether it's in the agricultural area, in the health area, uh, around energy. I mean, those are all areas that we have uh, worked in and where impact investments um, are really brought to bear. I feel the point, it's, it's easier almost to say, you know, where doesn't it work? Um, it, it works when you think about um, the, the near poor and probably the ones approaching middle class in those, in those countries. So for all these segments, market-based interventions work where that kind of capital can really um, uh, be, be relevant. When you think about the ultra poor, those are really people who don't have disposable income. So their social entrepreneur approaches are really less likely to work. So there we need to think about what are different solutions that we can use. And when you host um, intellectuals and policymakers who are trying to create a political discourse that necessitates concern for low-income people, what is the driving um, motivation that will, um, from your perspective, positively transform the, the political system so that their concerns are, are attended to. Um, we had an interesting conversation on this show with Governor Mitch Daniels, and um, he, he says, and from a, an American perspective, and I wonder how you'd respond to this domestically, but also from your experience abroad, um, there, there are the... Um, you know, haves and yet to haves, um, not have nots. And, uh, you know, he comes from a, a strong conservative uh, Milton Friedman esque view of the American economy, which is why I asked you from the outset about the rigidity of, of ideology obstructing what we can collectively define as well being. So I, I, I do wonder. Uh, what you think of that comment, um, the, the aspirational yet to have, and how the public consciousness can reflect people who have zero. That's certainly um, very true, that there are people who, well, who we clearly want to make sure that they are not forgotten. Um, and um, w one of the areas I think that we believe in is around the goal of inclusive economies. How can we connect those people uh, to economic opportunities? And uh, one way how we are doing that, again, looking beyond the Bellagio Center, is um, that we, for example, investigating and, and working with companies uh, right now how can they hire young people in particular because youth unemployment is such a big problem in the U.S. as well as in many other countries around the globe. How can these young people be better connected to the labor market? And one interesting uh, experiment that we, that we have been doing is um, that we use video games to test for ability of people and that we are finding that those you know, young marginalized people often have equal or better ability than the people who are currently in the job. Um, and so we are discussing this with, with employers now to really make them aware that even though sometimes these people don't have the resume to, that would qualify them for that kind of job, they actually have the soft skills um, that, that are required. So that is one mm. way of connecting um, and marginalized people. But I feel it really comes down, and, and that comes back to technology, the issue that you raised. How can we use technology um, to make those connections? Because I think it's a great connector, but what we are also finding is um, that um, people who, let's say, live in affordable housing or who are you know, marginalized often don't have the same LinkedIn profile like like others, and uh, how do we level the playing field in these areas? Well, one of your practitioners, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned that, at Bellagio worked on a project entitled Housing America, Reimagining a Public Housing Preservation Policy. Yeah. And now that you're largely based in New York, I wonder, what do you see as 
and, and perhaps her work informed your perspective of this. This is the President Emeritus of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment, um, Betsy Martins. Um, in New York, which is a, a challenge, for example, where homelessness has started to become more visible um, in this most recent mayoral administration, re-emerging re as a central point of, of public policy. Uh, how does the foundation view affordable housing as um, providing the means to well-being that we talked about? How are we going to, to build our way, in effect, to greater well-being? So affordable housing is, is not an area that we are currently specifically working on, although, um, I mean, Betsy wrote a uh, fantastic report, which I'm sure is, is up on her website, so I would encourage everybody um, to, to seek that out. But, uh, I mean, I feel that there are two areas. There's the question of, of finance um, that I think she touches on strongly. So how can this be made um, uh, m more affordable and, and where are potential funding sources uh, for good quality uh, affordable housing. I feel from a, a foundation perspective, we are very much, uh, w we provided, I think, Jane Jacobs, I don't know if it was her first grant, but definitely uh, with a grant uh, when she wasn't uh, as well known as she is today. Um, to, to take a mixed approach. I mean, how can we integrate affordable housing uh, into neighborhoods um, so that, that we, well, move away from a problem I think that's becoming even more pressing, um, the, the question of economic and, and social segregation. Um, so that, that Expand on that, the, the problem of economic, socioeconomic segregation. It's a, it's a new wave of segregation. It's certainly hitting the U.S. Yeah. Is it, is it yeah. as much it's, it's impactful abroad? Um, or is it a phenomenon you really discern here? No, it's not only here. It's actually a topic that we recently explored in identifying new opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we looked at um, exclusive economies in, in cities. And uh, what we are finding, I mean, in Europe, it's it's uneven, um, so it's not prevalent everywhere, but uh, certainly um, in, in certain cities you find the same symptoms of socioeconomic segregation that you find in the U.S. I think in, in the U.S. you just find it more consistently. Uh, and it really means that um, in terms of whether it's Again, access to jobs, access to good schooling, access to uh, good quality health services um, are limited given where where people live uh, and impacted where people live. And you have probably heard about the research um, that was published a couple of, about two months ago by, by Harvard researchers that said, if you move out of a neighborhood that is you're not as well connected, and you do that before the age of 13, it won't have impact uh, on your future income potential. But if you do it after the age of 13, it will, uh, and, and you don't have a chance to leave by that age, it really affects uh, your future earnings. So, I mean, segregation really defines from an economic perspective what people can achieve. And how do you combat the newly segregated United States uh, by by virtue of income? How do you how do you tackle that problem? I mean, I think the research and raising awareness, and it's clearly much more talked about than it just than it was talked about a, a year ago. Or so, um, I, I feels like a like an important point. I think there are uh, methods in terms of. Vouchers. I mean, that's something that you um, uh, have probably heard about. Um, we have looked at: is there are there predictive analytics? I mean, could we earlier identify that neighborhoods might be in danger of being segregated, and could cities invest earlier um, to prevent that from happening? So there are different approaches, and those are just two. And examples. what about those already segregated, where your efforts are to? In incorporate them into cities that have a more diverse socioeconomic condition 
where they will be welcome. It's, it's, it's kind of an economic assimilation that is a reality of this 99 and 1% economy. I mean, one example that we have worked on in the past is around transportation. So how can you connect as one way of connecting these neighborhoods uh, that mixed are often... Mixed income housing is mixed another in, one. Mixed income housing is another one. But uh, if you really definitely need a car to get to a good job or to a- any job at all, in a way, then, then that makes, makes it very hard. Um, so how can we connect those neighborhoods to affordable mass transportation, ideally? Um, that, that is one way to go. In future given that a lot of work happens online uh, and re- working from home, working remotely uh, is certainly becoming more and more of an option. That might also be something for those neighborhoods and connect them in a better way. Right now, though, we have the digital divide and you look at who is really using the Internet and who has those devices while we are widespread as a country uh, connected to the internet and uh, there are certainly neighborhoods uh, who are not as connected as others and Obama has a program uh, in place to address digital divide but I think there's still ways to go. Claudia, uh, our time is up but I'm glad you concluded with the digital divide because um, there are uh, a number of stories that reflect that innovative technologies in the hand of youngsters at a far earlier age. But does, that doesn't mean that the divide has at all... Not fully, yeah. ...at all shrunk. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.